God, I thank you for your presence here. God, as we get into your word, God, I pray you'll give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand what you would have us to do. God, give us the boldness and the courage to walk in it. God, I pray that you will remove blinders and you'll, you'll give us wisdom as we look into your word, Lord God. We want to be more like you. We want to be ever more and more conformed into your image and your likeness, Jesus, to, to grow to be more like you, Lord. So, God, will you have your way in me? Will you give me your words to speak that go out with your power and your clarity? In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Uh, we are in a sermon series going through the letter to the Colossians, uh, where we look at Christ in you, the hope of glory. And, and while you're turning there um, to Colossians chapter 1, you can also follow along on your phone or device uh, via the Bible app. Um, if you have the Bible app but you've never followed along, uh, all you need to do is when you're there is, is click on the more or the, you know, the three little dots that take you to the further menu and go to events. And your phone knows where you're at at all times, right? Because if, if the location services are on and knows you're here at Skiff Lake Bible Church. So that will be the first one that shows up. You can follow along there. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Colossians, but we're also going to bounce around. So if you want to follow along that way, you can. Before we get into the text for today, uh, I want to just do a little bit of review from last week. So remember, this, this book of the Bible called Colossians, it is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians uh, in the city of Colossae, and it was written because their leader had come to Paul because there was false teaching going on and he needed Paul's wisdom. Paul had never been there before to the city of Colossae. Uh, he had not met these people in person, uh, but he knew of their faith and their hope and their love, and so he was thanking God for them. And, and so what the purpose of this letter is, is to show that some of those, those false teachings that were rising up in that time, uh, that they were false. And we don't know exactly what those false teachings were, but we can piece together different things from what we know in history and from what Paul talks about is that, that some of these false teachers are saying, hey, look, there's this kind of secret knowledge you have to be able to have in order to be saved. They would put worth into following different religious festivals and keeping certain days and holy days and holidays. Or there were some of them that were such into asceticism that, that matter and the body is bad and the spirit is the only thing is good. And so... Paul is combating these things, but the way he's going to combat them is kind of with this verse that we have here. It's all going to be about Jesus, okay? And I don't know if my phone's working, so you may have to help me back there, okay? Colossians 1.18, he says, Jesus is also the head of the body, okay? There we go. The church, and he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So in order to combat this false teaching, he's lifting up Jesus. Look, Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church. Every believer within the whole world is formed together in the body of Christ, and Jesus is the head. He's not just the head, he's also the beginning, the absolute first. He's the firstborn from the dead, meaning he's the first one who has been resurrected, so to speak, has this resurrected body, and because he rose from the dead, Everybody who has put their faith in him, we will too. And why has this happened? So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. You see, the message of the book of Colossians is not just that Jesus is prominent. It's that Jesus is preeminent. He's not just the first among many. He is the one and the only, the first in everything, the only begotten son. There is salvation in no other name, no other way but Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul wants them to know. And what we'll get to in a couple of weeks is the mystery of this. And the awesome thing about this is Jesus is preeminent. He's everything. And he says the mystery is this, is Christ in y'all, the hope of glory. That Jesus Christ by his spirit would live within broken vessels like you and me. And the power that is at work within us. Because of Jesus dying in our place. So th that's kind of the theme on the book of Colossians. But today what we're going to be looking at is we're looking at faith, love, and hope. Which some of you may be like, that sounds out of order. Isn't it normally faith, hope, and love? Well, in this book, he actually goes at it, faith, then love, and hope. 
So we're going to be looking at that because this is some of the basic building blocks of Christianity. It's some of the basic words that, that if you've been a Christian for a long time, like those are words that you know what they mean, but maybe you don't know what they mean. So we're going to unpack them a little bit today. Now also the idea of faith, love, and hope, like these are marks of, of an authentic Christian. These are the ways that God wants us to be growing. So we're going to be digging a little bit into this, but will you join me? In Colossians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 8, and then we're going to unpack them a little bit. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of what you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just as in all the world also it is, consi- it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it's been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who was a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. So he's saying, you know, Paul is starting out basically almost every letter almost the same way, okay? Kind of the same way we would start out a letter, okay? You'd be like, dear so-and-so. Sometimes you would start out with a letter, especially if it's somebody that you've never met. You may say, hello, my name is whatever, and this is what I do, and this is what I'm writing to you. That's what Paul is doing. Look, I'm an apostle. I'm going to set one from God, and it's by God's will. Like, God Jesus met me on the road to Damascus when I was going around persecuting Christians and he revealed himself to me and he sent me out to bring the good news to people all over the world. That's who I am. And I'm writing to y'all who are in Colossae. I'm writing to the, the Christians that are there, the faithful brothers and sisters, those that are, have been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you. And then he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, we could look at it and just be like, oh, that's kind of nice. Paul starting out like grace and peace, okay? Like those are nice things for people to have, right? But I think it's more than that. He's not just saying like, I'm writing a letter to you and so and so. I hope everything's going well for you. And then I'm getting into my letter. In here, we see some of the foundation things that we need as Christians. We need the grace of God to flow in and through our lives. We need the peace from God and of God to be a part of our life. So before we get to faith, love, and hope, let's just look real briefly at peace and grace. In the book of Romans, uh, Paul writes this. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, that means made just as if you never sinned, by faith, by believing, we now have peace with who? What does it say? God. Because Jesus died in our place when we believe in him, okay, that's what it means to have faith, we can be made just as if we never sinned, and that gives us peace with God. And it's a peace that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, through Jesus, we don't obtain our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. So we're focusing on peace, that's why it's there in yellow, but I put the other words in orange because we see how peace and grace and love and hope and faith all work together. But it says, look, because Jesus died in your place, you now have peace with God. Why? Because he's made it just as if you never sinned. So you can stand before God in judgment as if you're completely perfect. You can have confidence to come into God's presence because He has made you just as if you never sinned. That's what justified means. So God wants to give us peace with Him that I think leads to peace within ourselves. Because the Scriptures talk about there's times when our heart condemns us. Anybody ever been there before? Like you know your sin. You, you, you know the places that you mess up and you struggle with, and our heart can condemn us sometimes, or Satan wants to condemn us. But when we realize that God has made peace between himself and ourself, we realize that we can have peace with, within ourselves because he's washed us clean. That when we face anxieties and we face uh, the hard things in life, we know that even in the midst of those anxieties, we have this peace with God that is like our anchor. And so the peace with God, I think, leads to, to peace within ourselves. And in the book of 
Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says this, In Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, then skipping down to what's in white, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. So God wants to give us his peace because Jesus has washed away our sins. We have peace with God, which allows us to have peace within ourselves. And then part of the reason why Jesus died is that anybody and everybody who calls on the name of the Lord, like we are gathered into one group. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity or your race or your gender or anything like that. Like you are brought into the family of God and there can be unity there. There can be peace among people, right? So the peace with God, I think, leads to peace within ourselves, and the peace of God also allows us to have peace with one another. In the book of Romans 8, 28, if we can go to the next slide, uh, the scripture says that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. So God wants us to have his peace between us and him, peace within ourselves, peace with one another, and peace in the midst, because how many of you have ever been through something that was really a struggle, really a hard time? Yeah. And the Bible says this, for those that have put their faith in Jesus, those who love Jesus, who love God, who've been called according to his purpose, no matter what we face, God is able, and he will cause it to work together for good. And that can be hard to hold on to sometimes, Because sometimes we experience tragedies that we're like, I don't know how any good can be worked out of this. And you know what? Sometimes we understand it later on in life. Sometimes we don't understand what is the good that is worked out of this until maybe we reach the other side of of, of eternity. But you see, Scripture says God does not lie. And so we can trust Him and we can have peace in the midst, even though we go through this world that is topsy-turny and moving all around, because we know that God is faithful and He wants to give us peace. Now, does that mean we always feel the peace? No, right? We don't always feel the peace. Now, does that mean that it's not there? No, sometimes it means that as humans, we let what we see, kind of like Peter did, the waves. We, let, we see the waves, we feel the things, and it shakes our peace. And I think that's part of being human. But God desires us in those moments to realize the truth of his word, that he has made peace between himself and us, and that he desires us to have peace in the midst, a peace that goes beyond understanding, a peace in the midst of anxieties that God says it actually guards you. It doesn't mean everything just dissipates, but in the midst of the hard times, we're guarded by the peace of God. So when Paul is saying grace and peace to you, like, I think all of these things are in his mind. We need the peace of God, especially in the world that is as crazy as it is. But it's not just peace, it's also grace, okay? And don't read that yet, okay, because we'll get to that in a bit, okay? But like, what is grace? It's a word we use a lot as Christians. There's a really famous song about it, right? Amazing grace. Almost everybody knows that song. Well, what is grace, okay? Yes, now you can look up there, okay? It's God's unmerited favor. The picture of grace is God's kindness and love and favor, like leaning towards us, like God's desire to give love, his desire to provide, even his desire to bless. Like it's that picture of just like God is leaning towards us with favor. He wants to give us favor. And it's not anything that we deserve, right? We talked about it last week. It's not like a merit badge that you earn in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, okay? You can't earn grace. It's a gift. You have to receive it. Here's some definitions of of grace by some um, different theologians that I want us just to look at, okay? This is a Dutch Reformed theologian, Herman Bavnik. Would you like to have that last name? Bavnik, okay? It is God's voluntary, unrestrained, unmerited favor toward guilty sinners, those of us that, that we're guilty, we, we are sinners, we deserve death. And it grants us justification. That means mean, being declared righteous, just as if you never sinned. Granting them justification in life instead of the penalty of death which they deserved. 
We deserve death because of our sins, but God's grace, which is unrestrained, it's voluntary, it's unearned, it's unmerited, it's his favor. He gives us life and forgiveness, justification instead of the penalty of death. Another theologian goes on to say it's this. It is the free bestowal of kindness on one who has no claim to it. The kindness of God given when we do not deserve an ounce of it. And this next definition is one of my favorite ones that I've read, okay? By J.I. Packer. The grace of God is love freely shown towards guilty sinners. Contrary to their merit and indeed in defiance of their demerit. I love that part. Because it's not just we don't deserve grace. It's not just that we don't deserve forgiveness. It's that we deserve hell separated from God. And in defiance of that, God gives his favor. It's God showing goodness to persons who deserve only severity and who had no reason to expect anything but severity. It's like a condemned murderer who's been convicted of his crime. The only thing that he deserves is the death penalty. And he knows it. He did his crime. And it's in defiance of that that forgiveness and grace is extended. That's the grace of God. To kind of give us a word picture of it, I got this from a pastor whose name is Kevin Harney, uh, and you may remember this story, okay? But does anybody have like a favorite car that you'd love to own or a car that you, that you own? Anybody have a favorite car? Anybody? I already, you last time you said it. Okay, back there, yeah. Black, oh, black, I will do black, okay? So a black Corvette Stingray. Let's pretend I have one of those. Sam is super jealous of me, okay? I have a black Corvette Stingray, okay? It's parked out in the parking lot. I have just finished eating my meal um, uh, at a Mexican restaurant because I love Mexican food, chips and salsa, all that stuff. Like life is good. And I walk outside, and when I get out there, what do I see? I see a kid with keys in his hands next to my black Corvette Stingray. <laughs> Keen my car. How do you think I feel? I don't even own that car, and I already feel it, okay? I want justice, right? We, we love justice when it's somebody else, right? We get pulled over for speeding. I don't, I don't think any of us would be like, I demand justice. Throw the book at me, officer, <laughs> right? We don't do that. Like, I... I, I can I just have a warning? Like, can I get off with a warning? Like, can I have some mercy? Can I have some grace? Okay, justice. I could go to that kid and I could say, what are you doing? Stop. I'm calling the cops. I'm going to file a report. You're going to get in trouble for this, right? That's justice. He deserves whatever consequence comes from breaking the law, vandalizing, uh, you know, uh, defacing my property, right? Mercy would be me coming up to him. Hey, stop. Stop. Just go. Just, just go. Like, just, it's okay. Just go. Don't do it again. It lets him off the hook for what he deserves. Grace would be me going, hey, Brandon. Here you go, Brendan. Brendan, not, Br yeah, Brendan, Brandon, whoever wants it. Brendan, you take it. You can have it. It's your car. Okay, and if you want me to fix all the scrapes that you, that you keyed, like, send me the bill, take it in, but it's your car. I'm giving you the car. You can have it. Corvette, black, stingray, Corvette, stingray, it's yours. Now, what if that would have happened in real life? Last time I preached on this, somebody said, they, they told me a story of somebody gave a car to somebody who needed it, okay? If it was Brendan who was out there keying my car, what does he deserve? And then what is he given? That's a picture of Grace. Because you see, when we sin, when we do the wrong things against God, it's like we're defacing his holiness, so to speak. And God, in defiance of what we deserve, gives us something even better than the black Corvette Stingray. He gives us his perfection, his righteousness, eternal life in heaven. He comes and lives within us, the, the hope of glory, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Like, I mean, I often talk about, like, it should blow our minds. He created everything. He's so powerful, right? And he would limit himself to come here as a baby. Like, babies can't do anything for themselves. Like, the God who created everything had to get his diapers changed for crying out loud, right? 
This should blow our minds. But that he would die for you and for me, and then that he would choose by his spirit to dwell within a sinner like me. That should blow our minds. It's something as Christians we should never just take for granted. Like, how awesome is it that Jesus Christ, who is the preeminent, first above everything, the one and the only, not just comes down to save us, but says, I will, I will live within you by my Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, to walk with you every day through the highs and the lows, to bring my peace in the, in the circumstances when it feels like there is no peace. And that's what grace gives us. Now, I'm going to need those keys back because they're not to a black Stingray Corvette, okay? It's to my little old Saturn gray car or something like that, which if you want to drive that around, you can sometimes. But that's what God's grace is. Now, let's continue on here just a little bit, okay? We're probably not going to get through all of faith, hope, and love today, and that's okay because that means half the sermon is written for next week already, okay? And then that means that you guys can actually leave for lunch after Sunday school instead of coming back after Sunday school and finishing the sermon, okay? Go ahead and turn the book of Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going we're gonna to start talking a little bit how grace and faith begin to work together. Because here in Ephesians chapter 2, again, this is a letter written by Paul. This is a different letter written to a different church in the city of Ephesus. But this letter was designed kind of to be circulated among the churches. And this is what he's saying, okay? He says, y'all were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead in the ways that you missed the mark of God's holiness. That here's a perfection of God and you didn't get there. You missed it. You were dead in the things that you say, think, and do that are against God. And in the things that you, the good things that you fail to do. In your rebellion, verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them too, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as to the rest. And then the next one is, but God. Now those two words in Scripture could be some of the most important words in Scripture. He says, look, this is what you used to be. You used to be living your life your own way, indulging in your sinful nature, doing what you wanted. Now, that doesn't mean everybody was over here just wildly partying and everybody in the world would just look at me like, man, that's a horrible person. But you were doing your own thing. You were looking to your own self. You were living how you desired. And maybe for some of you that was to be good, to work hard and to do all that. That's what you were doing. In the midst of that, no matter how good or bad or whatever you were, and we were, the outcome of it is it said we were objects of wrath. Why is that? I was talking with the youth group kids last week. We were talking about sin, and we were talking about the payment. And I said, have you ever wondered, like, why the payment for sin is death? Like, have you ever wondered that? I mean, because sometimes it's like, well, I told a lie. Now I deserve to die. Like, that doesn't seem right, right? Like, that seems extreme. And as we kind of looked at it, I, I said, you know, sin separates us from God. When we sin, it's kind of like we're scratching that, you know, we're defacing God's holiness. It's rebellion against God, little sins, big sins, whatever you want to call them. Like, we're separating ourselves from God, who's the author and sustainer of life. It'd kind of be like if I went outside in the spring and there's this flower growing, and I cut it like that flower has died as soon as I cut it. Now, it's not dead right now, but it's, it's been separated from the life-giving root, and it's going to die. That's what sin does to us. It separates us from God. And so like Scripture says, the wages, the payment for our sin is death. Because God has a just, a righteous, a holy wrath against sin. He hates it. Why? Sin kills. It destroys I hate cancer because I see what it does to people. That's what sin is like. And that hatred we can have for something like cancer or Alzheimer's or things like that, I think that kind of mirrors the, the, the anger that God has toward sin. And so because of our sin, we are objects of wrath. Even if we think that we have a lot of good things, they can't outweigh the sin that we do. And then verse 4, but 
God. Now let's get the rest of the verse. But God, what, what did he do? God being rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Like when we were like that flower that was cut, separated from the root, we were dead in our transgressions, our sins. He made us alive together with who? With Christ. It's by grace you've been saved. So when we were dead in our sins, when we were separated from the life-giving root, like that flower that we cut off, he made us alive together with Christ, and he raised us up with him, and he seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ. Why? So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his what? His grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So when Paul is saying grace and peace to you, I think this is what he, he's getting at. We need the peace of God. We need the grace of God given to us. And why are we raised with Christ? Why are we made? Okay, anytime you see a so that or an order that, okay, that's a really good thing to pay attention to because it's given you the purpose in the ages to come. And I think that's now and in eternity. God might show the surpassing riches. Okay, so like riches surpassing it. That's what that word means. So like if I had all this wealth and all this riches, it's what goes beyond that, the surpassing riches of his unmerited favor and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's the grace and peace that God wants to give. Let's, let's wrap up this passage here in the next couple of verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we may walk in them. So here's where we begin to see. We've talked about peace. We've talked about grace. And now we're kind of getting ready to transition to faith. He's already said this. It's by grace you've been saved. But he says it again. Look, it is by God's unmerited, undeserved favor and kindness given to those who do not deserve it, not just in spite of what they deserve, but in defiance of their demerit given to them, right? Those, those definitions we looked at. It's because of His grace that we have been saved. It's not by works. Paul is saying here, and we see it all throughout Scripture, you cannot be good enough to earn your way into the blessing of heaven. You can't work hard enough. You can't provide hard enough. You can't be good enough. You can't keep yourself clean enough. You cannot do it. You cannot save yourself. But the good news of the gospel is you don't have to because God wants to give you his grace that saves and forgives. How do we get access to that saving grace? What does it say in verse 8? It's by grace you've been saved through what? Faith. Good. Yeah, the answer is right there, okay? It's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Even our faith is a gift of God. Okay, verse 9. Not as a result of works so that no one can boast. Nobody can be like, look how good of a Christian I am or look how good of a person I am. You see, the only hope we have in Christ the only hope we have for salvation is God's grace extended to us that it, we receive it through faith. Not through being good enough, not through anything we do, but through faith. Now, what does faith mean? The word in, in, in Greek has the idea of to be persuaded or to rest in. It's the idea of trusting or believing. That's what faith is. So if we want to have this grace that saves us, it comes by believing and trusting in God. So let's look at, at a couple more verses, and then we'll wrap up for this week, and we'll get back into it next week. Paul said this, We give thanks to the God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we've heard of your faith in Christ. In the book of Hebrews, this is how the writer defines faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What that literally means is faith is the foundation of the things that we hope for. 
And when we talk about biblical hope, it's not like, I hope I get this for my birthday, or I hope that we get a lot of snow this week so we have a snow day, or whatever. It is a confident expectation. God has promised, and I know he's going to deliver. So our faith is the foundation for the things that we hope in, and it is the conviction or the evidence for things that are not seen. Faith is when we can look at the promises of God and we can trust that they're true even if we can't see them right now. So how do we get the grace that saves us if it's through faith? It's this. It's realizing your good works cannot save you. It's realizing you need a rescuer. It's realizing Jesus is that rescuer you need. His death on the cross functions as payment for all of our sins. And that's a whole other sermon of how and what and why. And if you have questions about that, talk to me. I love talking about it, okay? It's knowing those things, being persuaded that that's true, And even though you can't see it, it's saying, and I trust you to save me because you are loving and gracious and kind. And when you do that, the Bible says that you're a new creation, you're a new creature, you're resurrected, so to speak. You have new life in Christ. Christ comes to live in you by the Spirit of God, and you're rescued. You're made just as if you never had sinned. Does that mean that you're never going to sin the rest of your life? No. Does it mean the rest of your life is going to be puppy dogs and cupcakes and everything's going to be awesome and happy? No. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. That's one of those promises of Jesus that we're like, I see that with my eyes. Yeah, that's an easy one to be like, yeah, I see that. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. That's what he said. So next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about faith, love, and hope. Today we kind of centered on the grace and the peace of God because that's where it starts. We need the gift of God's grace. And if you have never received that, it comes by trusting. It's like we said last week. Remember I gave Carol the congregational report as a gift as just receiving. Yeah, I trust you to save me. You want to save me. And so I trust you. And I, I want to end with this last verse about grace. Because you see, as Christians, we don't, we're not just saved by grace. Not that verse, this verse. From the book of Titus, chapter 2. The grace that saves us is the same grace that trains us. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age right now, looking forward for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself up for us to redeem us, to buy us back from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own purposes, zealous for good deeds. Now, the part I want to focus on is the grace of God appeared in Jesus. It's a grace that brings salvation to everybody, and it's a grace that instructs us like a teacher does a child or a parent does a child. That's what that word means. And if any of you have kids or grandkids, you, you understand this a little bit. How often do you have to tell the same thing to your kid <laughs> over and over again? And then you think they get it, and then they don't get it. And that's the thing. For, for you as a Christian, God's grace that saved you is a grace that teaches and trains you like a child. That is always there. When we take the wrong step, God's grace pulls us back in and sets us on the right course. And pulls us back in and sets us on the right course. So it's kind of two challenges for us today. And I think we're just closing out with this. We don't have a song, right? Are we done? Okay, we're done after this. Two challenges. If you're a Christian, then I encourage you to rest in the grace and the peace that Christ wants to give you, that Christ has given you, that unmerited kindness, favor of God, better than that black Corvette Stingray. You can rest in that gift that he's given you. You can allow that gift of his grace and his presence in you to help teach you and train you, change you and transform you. 
And the second challenge is if you have never put your faith in Jesus, if you have never, by trusting in God through faith, received that grace, I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. And if that's you today, I'll kind of lead you through a prayer that, that you can pray to express. And today, God, I pray that you encourage us and strengthen us to realize the gracious gift you've given us of yourself, your, your grace that we have in you that forgives our sins, that bestows us with blessings and kindness and strength in the midst of trials and troubles. We thank you for that, God. Will you encourage us in that? God, will you be our peace that you say that you are in the midst of trials and hardship? God, will you be our peace and will you help us to be vessels of peace for others? And God, for those here today that maybe have never put their faith in you, have never received your grace by trusting in you, God, I pray you'll work in their hearts to reveal yourself to them. God, your word says that without faith it's impossible to please you because people when they seek you must know that you actually exist and that you reward those who earnestly seek you so god i pray that you will put a heart in all of us to earnestly seek you and if you're here today and you you want to reach out to god and trust him then i encourage you as i as i pray this prayer kind of pray it in your own heart with your own words lord i know the wrong things that i do and i know there's probably so much more that I don't even realize is sinful and wrong. God, sometimes I've tried to just trust in my own abilities, just live a good life. I realize I, I, can't, I can't be good enough. God, I, I don't understand how it all works, but, but I've come to see that you, Jesus, died in my place to take away my sins. And I need you to do that. And so now I, I'm asking you, Jesus, will you forgive me of my sins? Will you wash me clean? Will you save me? I know you died. I know you rose again. And I know you're coming again someday. And I put my full weight into you to save me. In your name, Jesus, I pray, amen. If you pray a prayer like that for the first time today, then when we're out in the fellowship time, please grab me and talk to me. Because you see, putting your faith in Jesus, receiving that grace, it's the best decision you'll ever make, not just in all of your life here on earth, but for all of eternity.